I find the story of Nadab and Abihu to be one of the more interesting Old Testament stories. In Leviticus chapter 10, after we have chapter after chapter describing the requirements for each type of sacrifice, how the priests were to be ordained, then the consecration of Aaron and his sons. All of a sudden, in chapter 10, we get two sons of Aaron who decide to be innovative. The first three verses of Leviticus 10 tell in rapid fire how well this uh, innovation was received by God. Very briefly, let's just read it here. Now Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord has said. Among those who are near me, I will be sanctified. And before all the people, I will be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. I bring up this text because I think this text highlights the, the third command, the negative side at least, of the third commandment so well. In a striking way, the Lord demonstrates how serious he is about how his people take his name and how important it is that they not take his name in vain. God tells Aaron, after frying his sons, who, as the KJV says, offered strange fire, God tells Aaron that he will be glorified before all the people. That is to say that there is a weightiness to the name of the Lord that requires those uh, who are called by it to be thoughtful and careful. Thus we have the third commandment and its prohibition against the profaning or abusing of anything whereby God makes himself known, and that includes the sacrificial system and the priestly office. And this uh, idea that taking the name of the Lord in vain uh, goes well beyond simply swearing or using uh, the Lord's name uh, lightly in conversation. And this is especially evident in the prophecy of Malachi. Time and again in that book, the Lord disputes with his people, particularly with his priests, because they do not take him seriously. Uh, they take him lightly. And look just at, uh, at a few texts in Malachi to briefly uh, touch on this idea of how not to take the name Lord, the Lord's name. Malachi 1 verse 6, a son honor his father, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priests, who despise my name. In this first dispute here, Yahweh specifically calls out the priests for essentially taking his name in vain, not giving him his due honor, not um, considering uh, the weightiness of his name. It continues on in the end of verse 6 and into verse 7. This response to his uh, indictment but you say, how have we despised your name? Verse 7, by offering polluted food upon my altar. This is, the, verse 6 into verse 7, supplies the grounds for the Lord's accusation, which is then detailed in the rest of verse 7 and into verse 8, where we see he uh, another response to God. But you say, how have we polluted you? By saying that the Lord's table may be despised. In verse 8, when you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor? Says the Lord of hosts. In summary, these first three, these, these three verses here, um, Point at God points out through these verses that the priests are treating both God and his design for the sacrificial system lightly. Remember that God had required that the sacrifices be uh, without blemish. And so their lack of following God's ordinances 
demonstrates that they take the name of the Lord in vain. Even worse, Yahweh points out their double standard in verse 8. They would never serve such things to human officials, but to the creator of heaven and earth, they are content to offer sloppy seconds. That all of this is grounded in a contempt for the honor and gravity of God is made explicit in verse in chapter 3, verse 14, where God indicts his people again. He says, you have said it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping his charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? In this verse here we have uh, uh, the vanity that the people ascribe to God's name, which is precisely why God uh, presents this third commandment to his people. Such is the negative side of the third commandment. You see, our hearts are prone to think lightly of both God and all the things whereby he makes himself known. In fact, this is rooted in the sin of our first parents. They considered it vain to serve the Lord, and so they ate the forbidden fruit. And by doing so, they, they took the name of the Lord in vain. They treated his name lightly by the way that they treated his commandment to them. But for all this talk of the negative side of the third commandment, we also have to treat the positive side as well. If we return briefly to Malachi chapter 1, we see the positive side here in verse 11. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And in every place, incense will be offered to my name and a pure offering. For my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Within chapter 1, God presents this, this opposition to the priest's profaning of the sacrifices, and it is the making of the name of the Lord great among the nations. And so from, from this verse, in its context, we see a connection between the name of the Lord and the works of the Lord. To treat with contempt the works of the Lord, the sacrificial system, is to treat the Lord himself with contempt, his name, by which he is known to us. But then, on the flip side, and the positive side, to honor the works of the Lord is to honor the Lord himself. And to honor the Lord, therefore, looks like honoring his word and his work in our lives. Now, again, this connection is established in the New Testament, where the name of the Lord and his works uh, are connected. Revelation 15, 3 and 4. Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the Nations. Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name, for you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. This song of the Lamb in Revelation 15 connects the works of the Lord, or more specifically the revelation of the Lord's works, with the glorification of his name. God's works reveal something about who he is. They have their own gravity and in their vital connection with his name, should then prompt praise and honor of God. This is the opposite of taking the name of the Lord in vain, but rather giving the due honor, the weight, the gravity to the name of God and all those things whereby he makes himself known. So then not only the Lord's name, but also his word and works, whereby he makes himself known, are covered in this third commandment on both the positive and the negative side. What then can we say about how this applies to us today? I've just got a few uh, comments here. Hopefully, uh, they will be meaningful application. As Herman Bovink discusses the fullness of this commandment in his Reformed Ethics, he begins by noting how absent-mindedness or irreverence in worship falls under the prohibition of the third commandment. To worship in spirit and in truth is to worship attentively and reverently. Rote religion, absent-minded uh, participation in worship, takes the Lord's name in vain because it does not take seriously that call to worship that begins the service. Secondly, Bhagavank uh, himself includes under the third commandment the importance of avoiding performative worship. For example, praying, preaching, or singing in such a way that draws attention towards the prayer 
The preacher or the singer treats God and his worship lightly, takes the name of the Lord in vain by seeking God's glory uh, for one's self, whether it's the prayer, the preacher, or the singer. Finally, and at the risk of sounding like a broken record, this commandment pertains to images and portrayals of the Lord Jesus Christ. That goofy cartoon of Jesus that you may have seen somewhere, many places, that cartoon of Jesus takes God's name in vain because it treats lightly the Lord. It presents uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in such a way that does a disservice to the fact that our Lord kills his adversaries with the breath of his mouth. Moreover, dramatizations of the passion or other stories from the life of Jesus, including modern day TV series, cannot but caricaturize our Savior because we inevitably, pre inevitably present him in our own image and through the lens of our own preferences, and therefore we take God, his name, and all these things by which he is known lightly. We take it in vain. Now, finally, to balance these exhortations towards seriousness in our worship and engagement with the Lord, I do have to say that, uh, as I have mentioned in the past, the scriptures certainly contain humor, mockery, and satire. To say that uh, thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain is not to say that you have to be some dour, uh, always um, sad and somber kind of person. Our God is not a killjoy. However, what this commandment does teach us, it provides this balance between the humor in Scripture and the seriousness of God, is that God himself is not to be mocked. His name is not to be treated lightly. Rather, we reverently and soberly approach his throne of grace with joy rather than jeers, even uh, considering whether those jeers are intended or not. So we are careful that we ought not to take the name of the Lord our God in vain. Let's continue with some discussion questions. First of all, why might it be easy to take the Lord's name in vain? Secondly, as works of God ourselves, we being made in his image as humanity, what does the third commandment say about the way we treat ourselves and our neighbor? To give a little bit more explanation of what I mean here, if uh, this commandment pertains to the name of the Lord and all those things whereby he makes himself known and he makes his image known through humanity, what does this commandment say about the way we treat ourselves and our neighbor? Finally, how can you give more attention to the third commandment in your attitude and your actions? Let's go to God in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do give you thanks that you have revealed yourself to us. We pray, O oh God, that we would come reverently and soberly uh, before you, uh, acknowledging that uh, though you have uh, been called the friend of Abraham and, and your children, Yet we come to you not treating your name lightly. Would that we uh, desired to know you, O God, as you have made yourself known in its fullness. We might praise you, O God, both for your uh, mightiness and also your mercy. And we pray all of these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.